as stipulated, I'm doing this mark remark from inside a steel cage, preventing any good jokes from entering it. Also, the piss break joke has been banned, so don't be surprised if I just explode into a cloud of urine during the Divas title match. My fellow Marks, and welcome to this extreme edition of the Mark Remark. This episode is so extreme that I'm not even wearing a tie. I'm fucking bonkers, me. You can't censor this shit. My name's Martin, and I'm softcore. I'm softcore. I'm softcore! This month's Prapreva starts with a commercial for piss in a bottle, or at least something about as healthy. The Mountain Dew voiceover guy describes the setup for Stone Cold Steve Austin's finisher. It all starts with a kick. This year, Extreme Rules emanates from the Allstate Arena, which is quite fortunate, as when the disappointed crowd ultimately and inevitably ends up rioting and taking their rage out on the vehicles parked outside, their owners will at least know where to go to get their insurance. This Prapreva is also being broadcast from Chicago. So you know what that means? There's lots of resentful CM Punk chants drowning out the inane drivel that the WWE believes constitutes entertainment. Speaking of inane drivel, let's meet our panel of experts. Renee Young, the expert at providing helpful insight. Booker T, the expert at being a helpless gobshite. Corey Graves, the expert at inspiring the new Joker design for the upcoming Suicide Squad movie. And Byron Saxton, the expert at being a third wheel, even when there are a grand total of four people involved. Renee Young is excited to begin. This is Extreme Rules and we are about to go off. Yes, much like a carton of milk that has been left out in the sun too long, this panel is about to go off. Vince McMahon has turned the Allstate Arena into his personal game of mousetrap, which makes a refreshing change from him treating the company like his own personal game of Monopoly, and him treating the wrestler's health like his own personal game of Operation. Try not to touch the sides. One too many concussions and you'll be stuck appearing in crappy WWE funded movies for the rest of your life. Byron Saxton butchers the title of KG Inafune's new crowd funded side scroller. Am I the Gaglamen number one? Booker T is so excited for the Extreme Rules opening pyrotechnics that he turns into Colin Firth from the King's Speech. In a minute and I cannot wait for the <laughs> Oddly enough, that is the most coherent and understandable that Booker T has been in months. The X Experts run down the pay-per-view card, and Renee Young announces that tonight we will see the first ever televised Kiss Me Ass match. Soon after that, the WWE Universe will take on the WWE creative team in the first ever non-televised Suck My Dick match. Sorry, I meant to say a Suck Me Tadger match. I forgot that doing it in a silly accent made it PG-13. Booker T gets us excited for the upcoming Women Who Hate Each Other Because They Have Vaginas match by referring to the Divas title as the butterfly belt. Because if anything is going to give divas a chance, it's by comparing them to one of the most fragile and harmless creatures in the insect kingdom. Renee Young utters the words that literally every announcer has wanted to say for years. Doing it right. Daniel Bryan has been injured and is not medically cleared to compete tonight, right after he won the Intercontinental title belt. Much like when he got injured last year, right after winning the WWE heavyweight title belt. It would seem the more prestigious the title, the more severe his injuries become. Safest bet really is to give him the Divas title. Although you could argue that that is the worst injury that one can sustain, even if you're a diva. Due to Daniel being out of action, the tag team title match is moved from the pre-show to the main card and is replaced by Bad News Barrett versus Neville. A decision that baffles everybody, as it means that Cesaro's streak of wrestling exclusively on the pre-show has finally been broken. We then go to Tom Phillips' bedroom, where he has positioned the camera strategically so that nobody can see his Buzz Lightyear-themed bedsheets. Booker T has his 
his own personal nickname for Tom Phillips. We've got Tom Phillips with the word with what's going on Oh, on the Dirty Tom. Dirty Tom, okay? I'm sure there's some discreet hidden meaning behind that. Let's see what Urban Dictionary has to say about that phrase. A person who is primarily a white trash pecker would. Nailed it! Tom Phillips accuses Byron Saxton of being out past his curfew, which is made even funnier when you realize that Tom Phillips' parents don't ever let him out of his room for fear that the other announcers might pick on him. Tom Phillips is going to be interviewing Kane, because the only way the WWE could think to make Kane seem interesting is by putting him next to Tom Phillips. Renee Young says that Kane has a ton of pressure on him tonight because he has to stand next to a door and occasionally open it and sometimes even close it. Oh, the pressure! Remember all those Inferno and Buried Alive matches he took part in? They don't hold a candle to the amount of pressure he'll be feeling standing next to a door and opening it and closing it. Oh, Probably shouldn't say candle around Kane, what with the whole being almost burned to death thing and all. Are we still acknowledging that, by the way? I don't know why I'm asking you, you don't even exist. The mighty gaggle of experts discusses the main event and mention that Randy isn't allowed to use the RKO. Randy is confident that this won't affect his performance, however, as he is quite used to not being able to use things, such as his time in the US military, where he was unable to use his balls. Seth Rollins is a veteran of cosplay chess. I play this game of human chess better than anybody. The experts theorize as to what Randy Orton will be able able to do without the RKO in his arsenal. Because if Randy is known for anything, it's for obeying direct orders and sticking to his guns. Especially when there's a lot of pressure on him to do that. He wouldn't want to disappoint his country. Sorry, his company. Byron Saxton competes with Booker for the role of King George VI. You gotta rewind da -da 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 -da. back a year ago. Booker T says that Seth Rollins needs to prove that he is the present. That's not really a lofty goal, is it? To be able to say, I exist right now. Oh yeah, well prove it. I mean, I kind of am doing that by merely existing. I don't believe you. Renee Young says some more gibberish about actual sports that have legitimate stakes involved before moving on to things that make way more sense, such as kiss me ass matches. According to Renee, Nikki Bella will be facing an angsty Naomi tonight. Because when I think of Naomi, I think of her sitting in the corner of an unlit room listening to Blink-182. Paige, glory unto her is Deemed beauty announces that she has finally purchased one of her favorite 80s horror films on VHS. This is my house! Eden Styles interviews angsty emo goth girl Naomi and posits that the only reason she received a title shot is because she dropped the nice girl persona. When everybody knows that Chie deserved the title shot before her, but unfortunately she's stuck with the Tomoe persona. Naomi has Fortunately, stopped trying to fuck Mr. Rossetti. Be who I really am and stop trying to fit into a mold that isn't meant for me to be in. Just don't turn the game off mid-coitus. He hates that. Naomi doesn't understand the importance of strategy-based board games. You wouldn't be where you are if you didn't take risks. We return to the panel of experts who are all talking about Naomi's pent-up anger. Well, could you really blame her? Wouldn't you be angry if every time you walked into a room, you had to hear this? Aw, oh, shucky ducky quack. Whack. Definitely makes me want to break out the Blink-182 and get just as angsty as Naomi clearly is. Dean Ambrose wanders onto the set while looking for his career, and then he switches seats with Byron Saxton, raising the average IQ of the expert panel by 75%. Dean attempts to promote his upcoming Chicago street fight, but is drowned out by CM Punk chants. Ironically, his fight to speak over the crowd is far more brutal than most modern-day WWE street fights. Dean says that even even though his head bounced off a ladder like a basketball, he still has a clear memory of WrestleMania. Everybody on the panel is very confused by the term basketball, as it doesn't exist in the sports entertainment dictionary. Then he rephrases it to bounced off a ladder like an XFL football, and they all understand it much better. Dean threatens to pile drive Luke Harper through the kickoff show table, which would mean that something entertaining would actually have to happen on the kickoff show, so it's highly unlikely to occur. All of the experts actively talk over 
over the guy who is trying to promote the event that is about to start. Disappointingly, Dean allows Byron Saxton to have his chair back, much like he allowed Seth Rollins to take the title at WrestleMania, despite having vowed to never let him do that. Byron demands to know why none of the other experts stuck up for him when Dean threatened him. The rest of them just laugh at his misfortune, because as we all know, watching people get bullied is hilarious. Don't forget to support Stephanie McMahon's anti-bullying campaign, by the way. Or I'll meet you after school and pour fire ants into your cock. Speaking of things that will make you cringe in first and second-hand embarrassment, the panel of experts promote the Kiss Me Ass match. Seamus claims he has returned to crush our hopes and dreams, which is a little too on the nose with its accuracy, honestly. Byron Saxton tells Seamus' new science fiction-themed origin story. Here's what's happened to Seamus. He was off for five months, and he woke up in the mirror and said, I'm not like anyone else. Wait, so Seamus woke up literally inside a mirror? Oh, well, that explains why he expects us to react to him with anything other than complete indifference. He comes from opposite worlds. Booker T contributes to the discussion. Stick with us, we're still gonna take a look at our last man standing match as Roman Reigns takes on the giant Romans. The Chris Jericho will be performing his podcast live on the WWE Network. Well, we say it's a podcast, but it's really just a long series of commercials for me undies strung together while his invited guests attempt to get a word in edgewise. Here's an example of the kind of hilarity that Chris Jericho's podcast brings to the table. Frank and Chicken! He's a bad mother clucker. Frank and Chicken! Bark, bark! Frank and Chicken! He's a bad mother clucker. Frank and Chicken! Bark, bark! Oh, that was it. I mean, I suppose I would have laughed at that if I was a barely formed zygote with a sense of humor of a tangerine. But yes, do tune in for more of... That. Chris Jericho will be interviewing Stephanie McMahon, who was his rival during most of his tenure in the WWE. They had hilarious banter together, which involved Stephanie standing in the ring and doing nothing, while Chris Jericho shrieked obscenities at her and called her a filthy whore. This was all while he was a good guy. I suppose we might be stuck in Seamus' mirror universe after all. Tough Enough is returning! And don't tell anybody, but I happen to have exclusive video footage of the odds on favorite to win. Hi, I'm Glass of Milk, and I'm tough enough to deliver calcium-filled goodness to your face. I'm gonna lay the smack down on osteoporosis. Not only that, but I'm endorsed by the Iron Sheik himself. You are up enough. I believe that I have what it takes to be a WWE superstar, because when I'm through with them, all my opponents will be lactose intolerant. Yeah! You have the power to make this a reality, WWE. The Extreme Rules logo prevents us from having to watch yet another Triple H promo. The applicants are surprisingly honest. I'm 33 years old and quite possibly in the worst shape of my life. Somewhere, the big show can be heard mumbling to himself, man, how am I supposed to compete with that? Renee Young explains the diva's side of the tough enough application process. You gotta go horizontally. That's right, all women must assume the missionary position. Because since you are expecting to be screwed over for the rest of your career, you may as well start early. While Renee tries to explain that literally anybody can become a WWE superstar, Booker stands up and poses for the crowd, proving that that yes, literally anybody can be a WWE superstar. Even Booker. It's Roman Reigns' Superman punch versus Big Show being out to lunch. Big Show's gonna get up when he wants to get up. We're going to be here for a while then. Uh-oh, things are getting too straightforward and understandable. Quick, it's time for yet another confusing and ambiguous Bray Wyatt promo. It is the little things in life that most of you get caught up in. The simple. The mundane. Speaking of mundane, this pay-per-view. Bray is addressing somebody larger than life, which doesn't really narrow it down any, as he could be talking about any given member of the Backstreet Boys. Bray Wyatt was one of the five people who bought and played to human. A man cannot become a god, but a god can walk amongst men. And if you thought Bray was good at spouting cryptic nonsense, just listen to Booker. I'll tell you something, the, the hypocrisy of Bray Wyatt knows no bounds. I mean, it, it, I said it at the beginning of Bray Wyatt when he first came in the WWE. It's about the reckoning. This guy's scary. Follow the Bookers. The panel theorizes as to who Bray is targeting, and Booker feels the need to add even more nothing to the conversation. Target, and he will let us know when he deems it appropriate. No one knows. Well, something Bray that knows. is being deemed appropriate is getting the action started. <laughs> He's just 
So damn insightful. Where would we be without him? Speaking of superfluous talent, Michael Cole and his bum chums are at ringside. Michael says that this is the one night a year that the WWE goes extreme. Unlike all those other super tame pay-per-views that they do, like Hell in a Cell and Tables, Ladders and Chairs, which involve puppies and cupcakes. They have very misleading titles. Jerry Lawler shrieks his concern. Every time we have extreme rules, bad things happen around here. Every in fact, every time a pay-per-view happens, bad things seem to happen around the commentary table. I think some people refer to it as the commentary. Blue's Clues comes out and takes credit for Daniel Bryan missing the pay-per-view, saying it's because he's too afraid of losing his title belt. In actuality, Daniel Bryan missed the pay-per-view because an important part of being Intercontinental Champion is being overlooked and totally forgotten about, and he really wanted to get a head start on that. Freezer destroys Planet Namek, and then Neville arrives, being announced as the man that gravity forgot, because he was never credited for all the stunt work he did for Sandra Bullock in that one movie. The audience starts chanting for NXT, leading Vince McMahon to believe that they're a crowd of illiterates who really just want to skip this match and go on to the next one. JBL is impressed by the girth of Wade's bullhammer, nudge nudge wink wink say no more. Cause what I understand from Wade Barrett is he brought a bag full of bullhammers to Chicago. Unfortunately he wasn't allowed to bring them on the plane, so they were confiscated by the TSA. Extreme Rules is so extreme that when Barrett has Neville in the corner, the referee forces him to break before the count of five. Talk about hardcore! Be Careful, you might end up giving him a minor bruise. That would just be too hot for TV, starring Jerry Springer for some reason. Speaking of extreme things, we cut to a commercial break in the middle of a match that isn't on network television. Promotional spots are just so extreme. We want sponsors. We want sponsors. No, but seriously, a commercial on a pay-per-view. I see absolutely nothing wrong with this. Oh, hey, we're back now and they're both in the ring, so I guess some stuff must have happened. Neville and Barrett do some more wrestling, but more importantly, you are watching the WWE Network. Thank you for subscribing. We basically own you now. JBL makes the best comparison in the history of comparisoning. Two Brits going at it, this kind of like... <laughs> William Regal against Dynamite Kid. Yes, them being from the same country makes it exactly the same as two other people from that country wrestling. John Cena versus Randy Orton. It's just like The Rock versus Stone Cold Steve Austin because they're both from the same country, you see. Jerry Lawler says that Neville can literally fly. Excuse me for one second while I go through a dictionary at Jerry Lawler. Okay, back. Neville pins Barrett after hitting him with the red arrow. So in the past month, Wade Barrett has lost 12 out of 11 matches. Jerry Lawler compares Neville's finishing move to David Copperfield's magic act, who is just like Chris Angel. Because, you know, they're both from the same country. Tom Phillips is joined by Kane, who will be acting as gatekeeper tonight. This entails him calling people maggots and banishing them to the black hole until they can roll their number. Tom Phillips fields really annoying questions from the fans, such as when is the new mark remark being uploaded, and why did Scratchy's ribcage play two completely different notes when it was hit in the same place? Are we to believe this is some sort of magic xylophone? Kane gets super upset with Tom Phillips and declares that he doesn't have to be disrespected by him or the WWE universe. Yes, he only has to be disrespected by the WWE creative team. Tom Phillips' urine escapes slowly down his pant leg. Renee Young promotes the United States Championship match, but she's drowned out by Lillian Garcia so it sounds like complete gibberish. It's rather like listening to Booker T. The panel debates as to who has the advantage in the United States title match, and Byron Saxton claims that it's Rusev, as the match was his idea. That's right, if you merely conceive of a match, you automatically have a better chance of winning it. For example, a barbed wire blamond on a pole match. So I'd probably win that because I just invented it. Also, my thirst for blamond knows no bounds. Booker T demonstrates why he's on a panel of experts. This is extreme rules guys it's a total different story russian chain match rusev's home today you know what i'm ready to get extreme are you guys ready to get extreme yes. booker t 
He has a degree in nonsensiology. The crowd starts chanting for Booker and completely ignores the other three experts who actually bothered to prepare. While the crowd is being goaded by Booker, the pay-per-view begins. The opening montage resembles something out of 1984 as if presented by Solomon Crow. Big Brother Love is watching you. The Extreme Rules logo resembles a poorly constructed Scrabble game. It's still okay to make fun of the Iron Sheik, because while he may be a depressed alcoholic whose daughter was murdered, in cold blood, that one YouTube video he did was pretty nuts. It's time for the extreme Chicago street fight, or as it's referred to in any other state, a street fight. This match is revenge for Luke Harper powerbombing Dean onto a ladder, which Dean is exacting upon Luke Harper by having a match with him where nothing nearly as violent as that happens. Jerry Lawler knows his wrestling history. Chicago, what more, what better city to get extreme in? Right, much better than Philadelphia, the home of extreme championship wrestling. Chicago makes way more sense because something about deep dish pizza? Luke Harper's entrance is an optometrist's wet dream. JBL continues to believe that Luke Harper is a zombie because, you know, weird equals zombie. Dean Ambrose better turn into Rick Grimes. He wants to find a way to win this one. Dean Ambrose would actually make a great Rick Grimes as he too has spent the last five years wandering aimlessly hoping that one day he'll catch a break. While Dean starts bringing out steel chairs, Jerry Lawler says that he's grabbing anything you might find on the streets or alleys of Chicago. Apparently in Chicago, the streets are littered with metal furnishings. You know, in case you need to sit down and enjoy your deep dish pizza. Ambrose hits Harper with a giant crazy straw, or something about as dangerous, and this street fight continues for the next 15 minutes to take place entirely in the ring. <laughs> Extreme rules! Dean revitalizes his cliche fake-out clothesline move by doing it outside the ring rather than inside. Everything that was once old is now new again. Dean chases Harper into the backstage area with a giant turkey drumstick or something about as dangerous and they both charge past the interview area causing Tom Phillips to get out of his chair and run away screaming mommy over and over again. Luke and Dean hijack a car only to pass Roddy Piper and Goldust going the other way. We cut back to the announce team who have no idea what's going on or how to describe it. They're also confused by the match that they just saw. Backstage Triple H is playing WWE 2K15 on his iPhone and is very confused by the whole creator wrestler mode as he just calls that NXT. He then orders Kane to go and find Ambrose and Harper as everyone knows it's against the rules to go out onto the streets in a Chicago street fight. The pay-per-view's title Extreme Rules is actually very misleading. It really means extreme attention to the rules. Seth Facings has a roll-off with Kane and Triple H tells them to stop being so childish. Speaking of being childish, the WWE Universe attempts to express its opinion. I understand and the importance of my role, and I appreciate the faith that you've shown in me. I will not let you down. I assure you, both of you. I personally don't disagree with the WWE universe here. I found this segment to be extremely lacking in any. It's time for yet another extreme bout, where two men will have a totally normal wrestling match, and then afterwards, one of them will kiss the other's ass. So it's just like literally every other wrestling match ever, except usually it's both men kissing Vince's ass afterwards. I should mention that there has never in the history of Kiss My Ass matches been a Kiss My Ass match that ended as stipulated. But there's a first time for everything, I suppose, and preferably a last time as well. The Spanish announced team also known as Latin Robert Downey Jr. and Jay Leno, are also joining the ranks of well-dressed men who refuse to drink Mountain Dew. This shit continues happening. JBL, how do you say arse in Spanish? It's hell arse. Hey JBL, how do you say go fuck yourself in Spanish? Sin cara? Thought so. Sheamus is apparently bothered that the WWE fans didn't notice he was gone. You were promoting his return for four months. If we didn't notice he was gone, that's probably not our fault. Then again, how could we forget such great contributions as the kiss my ass match? The commentary team is on point as always. I think what Dolph better worry about is Sheamus' backside, because I think that's what Dolph may be kissing tonight. Yeah, but what if Dolph wins? Yes! What would happen if the other guy you didn't say would win 
wins. But then who knows what would happen? Maybe the same situation only reversed. That would be pretty extreme. Seamus says he doesn't understand why people want to cheer for the likes of Dolph Ziggler or Neville. Probably because they don't subject us to kiss my ass matches. Jerry Lawler spends an inordinate amount of time wondering what will happen if Dolph Ziggler gets knocked unconscious and therefore can't kiss Seamus' ass. I don't think I've heard three men discuss the logistics of ass kissing this much since I rented the porno classic The Italian Rim Job. JBL is excited for his upcoming Rocky Horror Picture Show Shadowcast. Get the lipstick ready! Dolph Ziggler ends this anticlimactic feud with an anticlimactic roll-up and Seamus spends the next 10 minutes thinking he's in a big show match. I mean, stalling for time. He'll never be allowed back in Ireland! Yes, because if there's one thing the Irish are known for, it's for kicking people out of their country if they make a fool out of themselves. They're notoriously prudish people. Everyone gets on Seamus' case for his dilly-dallying. <laughs> Because if there's one thing that defines extreme rules, a pay-per-view about being hardcore and breaking all the rules, it's that you must adhere specifically to the rules at all times. You have to! Unpredictably, even though I literally just predicted it, Seamus doesn't follow the stipulated rules and forces Dolph Ziggler to kiss his ass instead. Clearly sticking another man's head between his ass cheeks and rubbing it there vigorously is significantly less embarrassing than the alternative. Are you done? Let's see, a match that stopped halfway when two of the competitors left the arena, and then a kiss my ass match that felt like the equivalent of getting a bit of stray cum in my eyeball. No, Seamus, not particularly. JBL helps accentuate Dolph's push. If I was Dolph, I'd take two weeks off and then quit. He won the match. Are we not going to talk about that? No? Okay. The King of the Ring is finally coming back. As a feature on the WWE Network. Neat. In other news, WrestleMania is being rebranded as a banner ad you see on WWE.com, and SummerSlam is being turned into a Tumblr gift set. Then this happens. It's all part of a historic oh, win city. on the WWE it's about Network. to get gritty! Stand on your feet and feel the power! It's about to get gritty, is it? Is Christopher Nolan going to direct the match, or...? The tag team the WWE deserves, but not the one it needs right now, takes on the team of Tyson Kidd and Cesaro. The New Day are baffled by everyone chanting that they suck, while Tyson Kidd and Cesaro are baffled by everyone telling them that they don't. Jerry Lawler suggests that Natalia might leave Tyson if they lose, and Michael Cole chastises him for spreading unfounded gossip, or at least tells him to save it until the new season of Total Divas starts up. Big E attacks attempts to jump over Cesaro, but the one fatal flaw in his plan is that he is attempting to jump over Cesaro, who is able to slam him with the efficiency of an internet wrestling fan slamming the latest WWE product. Speaking of internet wrestling fans, Xavier Woods whines about things he can't control. Stop! Why? What did we do? What did we do? We're winning! JBL says it would be great if the New Day won the tag team titles, but the only drawback, he says, is that we'd have to listen to Xavier Woods' obnoxious commentary every week at ringside. Yes. Imagine having to tolerate really annoying commentary week after week. After week. That would suck. Tyson Kidd is momentarily distracted by Xavier Woods, as he mistakes him for a wrestler that was once well handled, and then Kofi takes advantage of the distraction and gets the pin. But it's an unfair victory because Kofi was pulling the tights. Gosh, Kofi. This is so not in keeping with the spirit of extreme rules. Quit breaking the rules and stuff. The New Day celebrates their victory by playing Nightcrawlers. We return to the kickoff show panel and Renee Young has sadly left, leaving us with a much higher imbecile to expert ratio than usual. The experts go to great lengths to explain why Daniel Bryan can't compete, but nobody bothers to explain why Booker T can't act like a human being. Being. Renee Young almost escapes the WWE's clutches, but then is found at the last minute and forced as punishment to interview the New Day. Big E and Xavier Woods spend the first half of the interview licking their hands and polishing the WWE Tag Team title belt. As a tribute to when Shawn Michaels won the WWE title for the first time, and Vince McMahon spent the next several years licking and polishing him. Xavier Woods announces that this is the dawn of the New Day. So for every match leading up to this one, were 
were they technically the yesterday, the other day, the not long ago? Then a car wreck happens. No, not the pay-per-view, an actual car wreck. Dean Ambrose and Luke Harper make their underwhelming return to finish their Chicago street fight. Street not included. When they what? left, Harper was driving. They come back, Ambrose is driving. Who's driving? Oh my god, Ambrose is driving, how can that be? Harper and Ambrose start chucking steel chairs into the ring because there's nothing more extreme than haphazard littering and disorganized furniture. Luke Harper pays homage to the WWE booking team and buries Dean Ambrose. Then Dean Ambrose hits Luke Harper with Dirty Deeds, a double arm DDT that likely would have been a lot more devastating if he'd bothered to do it onto one of the five million chairs surrounding him. But no, he did it onto the canvas. Extreme rules. And so Dean manages to win the match and gain a new fight. Holy crap, a Pikachu! I'm going to catch it. Quack, quack! Cyborg, get back in your Pokeball. JBL spends more time promoting other networks than actually talking about what's happening on this one. Yeah, you never saw the insect comes out and knocks all the dirt back. It comes out. Watch the Discovery Channel, Mongo. There's a promo for WWE Payback, named after people's desire to get their money back following this one. In the video's narration, Roman Reigns paraphrases Batman, which is appropriate, as much like when George Clooney played Batman, people often look at Roman Reigns and say, what the fuck are you doing? It's time for the Russian cha 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 chain match. The only way to win this match is to drag your feud out for the next four pay-per-views. This gives John Cena a distinct advantage as he's been dragging his career out for the last decade. Russian Bulgarian Rusev comes out carrying a Russian chain alongside Russian Lana as they walk down to the Russian ring. This match is much more intense than a regular chain match as we all know that adjectives make things much more dangerous. Jerry Lawler is as happy as an elderly pervert who gets to stare at half-naked women every week. Oh wait. You guys ever seen in real life anybody driving a tank around? No, Jerry. Nobody has ever seen that. The US military may as well be a fictional organization. Michael Cole goes to great lengths to explain the bizarrely precise rules for this extreme game of tug of war. Say you only touch two and then your forward momentum is stopped. It's waved off. You've got to go back to the beginning again. It's going to make things rather confusing as the WWE as a whole hasn't had much forward momentum since 2002. To make things easier for the wrestling fans who don't believe that there are any numbers past three, the WWE has set it up so that pretty colored lights come on whenever Rusev or Cena touches the corner. Cena is represented by the color green and Rusev by red, from which we can deduce that John Cena is a Jedi and Rusev is a filthy Russian Sith Lord. Because if anything says extreme rules, it's decorating the ring with pretty colorful lighting. The lights don't operate as intended at first, but it's okay because this is extreme rules after all, and even the turnbuckles can get a little rebellious. This extreme and hardcore game of red light, green light is made even more intense by the Russian chain that attaches the two wrestlers together, making it nearly impossible for them to execute any of their signature moves with any accuracy. So they're limited to just sort of tussling each other from one side of the ring to the other in awkward succession. Rusev gets three Russian lights, but unfortunately for him, there are four lights. What he said. Michael Cole's sensors detect the presence of an intelligent wrestling fan somewhere in the audience. It Smart. Rolls out of the ring. Smart. The fans are so into this violent grudge match that they start chanting for the ineffectual blonde woman standing beside the ring, causing Rusev to banish her to the backstage area. Probably for the best. After all, this extreme game of jump rope was getting rather violent, and we wouldn't want any innocent bystanders to get hurt, would we? Jerry Lawler thinks that Rusev should go easy on Lana. I send her away. Too, I'd fire for doing that. Trying to upstage Rusev. You would honestly fire Lana. Come now, JBL. Then who would Jerry have to ogle during Rusev's matches? Michael Cole? Please don't ogle Michael Cole, Jerry. John Cena does the Russian five-knuckle shuffle and doesn't bother to wrap the Russian chain around his fist. Extreme Russians! Wrestling commentary happens. Alabama Slammer! I don't think Rusev would call that an Alabama Slammer. It's the Chernobyl uh, 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 wait, 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 wait. Ah, yes, because Chernobyl is in the Ukraine, which was once part of Russia three decades ago. Any chance that while you're making geographical blunders that you could call a move or two? No? Okay.
Rusev applies the accolade to John Cena, a move that would be far more damaging if he implemented the Russian chain. So of course, Rusev doesn't do that. Extreme rules. Rusev and Cena hit three corners, and then John Cena stops what he's doing to hit Rusev with the AA. But apparently that doesn't stop his forward momentum, so he wins. Extreme rules. Rules not included. The Russian-American flag flies over the Russian ring, because apparently there's nothing more patriotic than playing a violent game of Simon while trying to choke your opponent to death. Following this patriotic victory, there's an even more patriotic commercial for Mountain Dew, featuring a guy riding a skateboard and setting fire to shit. USA! 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 Mountain Dew steals their marketing campaign from Dennis. As punishment for trying to escape earlier, Renee Young is forced to interview Roman Reigns, who delivers a promo on Big Show with all the presence of a high school girl talking about a classmate behind her back. Roman says that he's proven to the world that you can knock him down, but you can't keep him down. So he's the wrestling equivalent of a weeble, both ability and personality-wise. Speaking of ability and personality, the WWE would have you believe that the Divas division has neither. Nikki Bella comes out to defend her title and you can tell she's a good guy now because literally nothing has changed. Naomi comes out with a catchy new theme tune and colorful glasses and boots. Clearly this is the very definition of angst. I have never laid eyes on a more angsty person than Naomi. The commentary team spend an inordinate amount of time discussing Naomi's footwear. Wait a minute. Where have I heard this before? Naomi shoes. Oh my god, that was foreshadowing. Jerry suggests that Naomi is wearing those lighted boots to distract her opponent. You know, like a butterfly uses its patterns to confuse its predators. Because we really needed to compare the divas to harmless insects some more. In the middle of the match, John Cena runs out and taps both of Naomi's shoes, mistaking them for Russian turnbuckles in a Russian chain match. At ringside, Brie Bella is wearing a plaid shirt and a matching hat that makes her resemble a lumberjack outside the ring. A secret lumberjack match! <laughs> JBL needs to watch less Supernatural. Looks like she's been out Bigfoot hunting. Do what? He's like a lumberjack. So lumberjacks hunt for Bigfoot? Still a more compelling depiction of lumberjacks than the final episode of Dexter. Bree is able to avoid Naomi's finisher, the rear view, and hits her with her own finisher, the rack attack. So in case you aren't keeping score, both women's finishers are named after their T and A. Just like in the men's division, where John Cena's finisher is called the cock block, and Big Show's finisher is balls. That's not the name of the move, his finisher is just balls. Nikki retains her title thanks to outside interference from her sister. You know, because they're good guys now. JBL is having flashbacks to WCW. Nikki retains her title thanks to her sister Bree with that Yeti kick. Rusev gives Lana what for. Lana! Lana! Meanwhile, Lana goes and meets with the authority, setting up for an angle where she will become the face of the company. Because if the WWE is going to showcase anything, it's definitely going to be a woman's face. Her personality, you know. It's time for the last man standing match, featuring a fully functional Roman Reigns animatronic, taking on a barely functional Big Show animatronic. The only way to win is to incapacitate your opponent till the count of ten. Or if you were to ask Booker T, he would tell you that the match is unwinnable because time is an illusion. Or he'd say this. Nine. <laughs> As the big show comes out, Michael Cole reminds everybody to watch their favorite movies and TV shows on Hulu. Assuming your favorite movie is Alligator X and your favorite TV show is The Awesomes. Big Show has said that his goal is to make Roman Reigns the biggest epic fail in the WWE. Well, short of putting him inside an egg and having him dance with Gene Okerlund for 10 minutes, I'm not sure what else there is to do at this point. At the start of the match, Big Show forces Roman Reigns into the corner. Oh, but the referee says you have to break on the count of five because this is extreme rules, don't you know? It's totally extreme and shit. Big Show does his best Tracy Jordan impression. Reigns just beginning to stir. I am a Jedi! I am a Jedi! 
JBL says that Roman is getting a physics lesson right now. Yes, he's learning that career velocity is acceleration to WrestleMania divided by the amount of time that people on the internet spend making memes out of your dumb facial expressions. Roman brings out a table and Big Show responds by placing an extremely well-described boot into his stomach. At size 22, 5E boot. Nice try, Michael, but no matter what you try and do, no footwear description will ever beat. Hey, me shoes. Big Show spends the next five minutes wrestling with the table, having understandably mistaken it for Roman Reigns, and then ultimately breaks it in half with his bare hands as part of Roman Reigns' physics lesson, which is a demonstration of the immovable object meeting the unmotivated force. Roman starts hitting Big Show with a plywood selfie stick, and then JBL compares Big Show to King Kong. You see, Big Show is actually just Andy Serkis in a gimp suit, thrashing about like a lunatic. The technology isn't quite as impressive as it used to be. Big Show does sort of punches Roman Reigns and it keeps him down to the count of eight. Oh shit, sorry, that's his finisher. I mean, oh, oh, yes, he, he really knocked him for, for six there. It, it, the punch and everything, yeah, big deal. How'd he pull that off? I mean, incredible. Roman counters a choke slam into a Samoan drop through the table because you can't keep somebody in the corner for longer than five seconds. But if you want to put somebody through a table, that's cool. Big Show hits Roman with a spear, but remember that's not nearly as powerful as his magnificent punching ability, and gets up saying Booyah! The crowd attempts to respond in kind, but they forget about the ya part and focus way more on the boo part. Roman starts carefully setting up tables outside the ring, and JBL compares it to playing with Legos. You clearly know nothing of Legos, JBL. Legos are way more dangerous than tables. You ever stepped on one? That would be enough to put me down for the count of ten. Big Show choke slams Roman Reigns outside of the ring through two tables. Now imagine if those had been Legos. Motherfucker would be dead. Instead, Roman gets up before the count of ten, forcing Big Show to start disassembling the announce table. Sadly, he does not disassemble the announce team in the process. He does, however, find a notepad. <laughs> Why would you write that? <laughs> it was your notepad. Big Show, stop eating all that junk food. It's not going to make your problems go away. I'm having fun. The crowd starts chanting for JBL, but he's far too busy reading his Spanish to gibberish dictionary to get involved. Roman spears Big Show a multitude of times, and Jerry Lawler compares Big Show getting up after the spears to a phoenix rising from the ashes. Yes, just look at that beautiful image of life emerging from the dust. They should have sent a poet. In one of the most convoluted spots outside of a Jeff Hardy match, Roman Reigns manages to run up the steel steps and spear Big Show through the Spanish announce table from the English announce table. Oh, I see. The word extreme is short for extremely improbable. Reigns flips the other announce table on top of Big Show, which makes him unable to get up. Because as everybody knows, being in close proximity to the announce table turns you into a blithering idiot incapable of anything more than the most rudimentary of thought. Michael Cole accurately describes Roman's victory. Ladies and gentlemen, Roman Reigns has arrived tonight! Yes, you see, when he won Superstar of the Year, then the Royal Rumble, and went on to main event at WrestleMania, he was just sort of on his way. But now that he's won this match at the pivotal Extreme Rules pay-per-view, he has made it. The Marine 4 moving target is now available on digital, Blu-ray, and DVD, featuring audio commentary by a small Irish bloke named Greg, as he was the only person they could rope into the studio to take the fall for this crock of shit. Corporate Kane is caught inside one of those mandatory aimlessly walking backstage cutscenes from SmackDown 2 Know Your Role, and then he runs into Randy Orton. Randy gives Kane a history lesson about his character, and Kane is baffled, as he completely forgot that that whole six month period where he couldn't speak without using a voice box. In fact, he's like, what? Without an announce table, the commentary team is very confused as to what they should do with all the Mountain Dew that they weren't going to drink. And don't forget, there's still time to enter into the Tough Enough competition, even though the winner is already rather obvious. Jerry Lawler has a wrestling match with modern technology. Bo Dallas comes out to the ring. Why? Your guess is as good as mine. Oh, it turns out he's cutting the same promo 
that he's been doing for the past two years. Only this time it's different because he's addressing the crowd and berating them. Haven't seen that before. Glad I paid good money to see it happen. Bo Dallas insults Chicago and tells the fans that they don't shower. And since this entire event is taking place in a high school in the 1980s, this is all extremely effective. Bo's voice gets higher than the WWE creative team. All you have to do is boo! To make things even more fresh and entertaining, Ryback comes out to interrupt what Bo was saying so that he can beat him up. Which is definitely something that should be happening on the pay-per-view and not on the pre-show, which is what shit like Neville vs. Barrett is for. Michael Cole calls what just happened inspirational. If only it could have happened at WrestleMania, then it would have qualified as a WrestleMania moment. Much like other such classic WrestleMania moments, as Vince McMahon tying his shoelaces or Kofi Kingston eating an entire bag of marshmallows. True WrestleMania moments all. Wild Stallions interviews Rusev, and then we learn that Lana has negotiated an I Quit match for John Cena and Rusev at the Payback pay-per-view. Or as CM Punk's Twitter followers would call it, an I Quiet match. Now it's time for the title match between Seth Rollins and Randy Orton, which had to take place within the confines of a steel cage, as it's the only way to get Randy to commit to do anything. In this extreme match, that has been designed specifically so that there could be no loose ends left untied, the only way to win is by pinfall or submission, or by climbing out the cage and leaving it, or by walking out the conveniently highlighted doorway, or by bullshit sports entertainment nonsense. So this match will definitely have a definitive ending. Kane comes out to keep some gates, and the announcers argue as to what he believes to be best for business. Judging by his character as of late, it probably involves doing fuck all and replacing anything remotely interesting interesting about his character with a business suit. Oh, sorry, that's what the creative team thinks is best for business. Jerry Lawler goes to great lengths to explain why having a match in a steel cage will prevent any outside interference from happening. In fact, steel cages are so foolproof and airtight that nobody so far has been able to leave one voluntarily. All the other cage matches are technically still happening. Kind of like that movie Cube, only with less mind-bending puzzles and more punching people in the face. Randy Orton sets up Seth for an RKO off the side of the cage, but that move is banned. So he chooses instead to do one of the many other moves that he could do from this position and just sort of drops him. That viper, always thinking. Randy has the option to leave the cage, but chooses instead to turn around and torture Seth some more, which Jerry Lawler describes as the viper mentality. Because one of the classic traits of the viper snake is trying to leave a room and then turning around and beating the piss out of somebody instead. Watch the Discovery Channel. JBL compares Seth Rollins' agility on the cage to Velcro Man from David Letterman. Be careful, JBL. The last thing we want is another Seth Rollins talk show host rivalry. Jerry Lawler forgets where he is for a moment. This is what you wanted. You wanted this now taste it! Seth super kicks a tooth out of Randy Orton's mouth. And Kane has to resist every dentist urge in his body to go in the ring and perform oral surgery. Some gimmicks just don't die. Rollins almost escapes the cage, but is pulled back in by the gravitational force of Randy's blanditude. J and J security interfere in the match after the commentary team spent the last 10 minutes and several weeks explaining why that would not happen. Randy takes a page out of Triple H's book and wastes some time chastising the internet when he probably has much better things to do. He also uses the pedigree. Kane opens the door for Seth, but apparently walking through a door while you're in a cage is extremely difficult and Seth spends the next five minutes pretending that he's stuck in some sort of sticky, jello-like substance before being taken out by Randy. Kane shocks everybody by closing the door on Randy. Because he and Randy used to be best buds or something, right? They have some sort of history, don't they? Look, this moment is significant for some reason, okay? Just like that classic Bo Dallas segment from earlier. Rollings and Randy try to escape the cage only to have the door thrown in their face by Kane, which is ironically exactly what happened to Kane when he went to Vince's office trying to ask for his old gimmick back. Kane removes his business suit and walks into the impenetrable cage alongside J&J &J security, his mother, and J&J &J security's mother, proving once again that anybody and his mother can interfere in a fucking 
steel cage match. Kane choke slams everybody involved, which is great because I was hoping that this feud ending grudge match would end totally ambiguously and disappointingly. And then Randy hits Kane with the band RKO. The referee thinks about disqualifying him since that's literally the only rule in effect here, but then he remembers that it's fucking extreme rules and that would be idiotic. Seth Rollins presses A and B at the same time and hits Randy with his own finisher and then squirms his way outside of the cage door, which judging by how long it takes him to do this is apparently much, much harder than climbing up the wall and jumping out. The announcers close the pay-per-view by arguing about the match stipulations and saying how none of them really understood them, which is exactly how you want to end and a show with confusion and ambiguity. You've been watching The Mark Remark. Or have you? Quack, quack!